Hello, this is Mad Cat, the angry egalitarian that discusses this and that. And today we are going to talk about females required to sign up for the draft. Celebrate good time, come on! Due to copyright issues, I can't actually post that song. Because then I can't monetize my videos. And even though I don't make a whole lot of money doing this, I still want to monetize my videos. So... You have to suffer my singing. Celebrate good time. Come on. It's celebration time. Very historical moment that we now have women required to sign up for the draft. As passed by the Senate. And as great of news as this is, it's a little bit premature to really celebrate this. Although the news media is making a big deal about this. It's like, oh, it's going to be a law and it goes into effect on January 1st, 2018. Well, see, there's a couple of lingering questions about this that we kind of need to address before we really start celebrating. For instance, the House, even though they passed this bill, they didn't pass a bill that had women requiring to sign up for the draft. The Senate did, the House didn't. So how could that be made into a law if they did not vote on the same thing? And can't the president still veto it? We're going to answer these questions today and investigate this a little bit more so we can try to understand how the American political engine works and what needs to happen from here before this can actually be made into a law. Before we get started with that today, we're going to take a quick look at Selective Service itself and why is this such an important issue. So let's go ahead and whew, right on over. Selective Service System. So the Selective Service System, which is a requirement Virtually all male U.S. citizen and male immigrant non-citizens between the ages of 18 and 25 are required to have registered within 30 days of their 18th birthday. Now, registration with Selective Service is also required for various federal programs and benefits including student loans, job training, federal employment, and naturalization. Selective Service went into effect on May 18, 1917, which is about a little over a month from when the U.S. declared war for World War I on April 6, uh, 1917. And here's a table showing the number of people drafted per war. Now, this is the number of people that have been conscripted because of Selective Service since it was founded in 1917 and this goes all the way to 1973 100,000 there 100,000 there here there everywhere until 1973 which we only had about 600 people now if you add all of this up together that comes out to over 17.7 .7 million people 17.7 .7 million men for a span of 60 years were conscripted into the military and women never were. So what happens if you fail to register? In 1980, men who knew they were required to register and did not do so could face up to five years in jail or fine up to $50,000 if convicted. The potential fine was later increased to $250,000. If you go to jail, you do lose your ability to vote. And this was why some people associate selective service with voting. Because you could potentially go to jail if you don't. And then you can't vote anymore. A requirement that's not put on to women. They cannot lose their ability to vote for not signing up for selective service. Now, from 1980 to 1986, there were only 20 indictments. And 19 were those of people who basically said, I'm not going to sign up for it. 
Now, that's kind of the difficult thing with prosecuting people on this crime is that you have the government has to prove that they knowingly and willfully did not sign up for selective service. Which is impossible because how can you know what's in someone's head unless they self-identified saying they wouldn't do it. Or the FBI visited you and said you have to sign up and you refuse to still do so after that. The last case prosecuted for the Selective Service was in January of 1986. However, the Selective Service system officials really stopped pursuing anyone after 1988. The Selective Service found an another way of encouraging or coercing people into registering. Uh, federal legislators passed laws requiring that to receive federal aid, financial grants, loans, certain government benefits, eligibility for most federal employment, and if the person an immigrant, eligibility for citizenship, a young man had to register or had been registered if they were over 26 and required to register between 18 and 26 with selective service. Those who were required to register but failed to do so before they turned 26 were no longer allowed to register and thus may be permanently barred from federal jobs and other benefits unless they can show to the Selective Service that their failure was not knowing and willful. Basically, the federal government said, well, if you don't sign up, then we're not going to give you federal loans to go to school with. And since most ways to get money for college is through grants and scholarships, and so few are really eligible unless you are super, super smart or a really good athlete or you're a black or woman. So white men really couldn't get anything unless they were one of those things. You need all the money you can get, so you're kind of forced to sign up for it just so you can get federal grants. Now, furthermore, most states, as well as the District of Columbia, Guam, Northern Marina Islands and Virgin Islands have passed laws that require men 18 to 25 to be eligible for programs that vary on a per jurisdiction basis, but typically include driver's license, state funded higher education benefits and state government jobs. Eight states, including Puerto Rico, have no such requirements though Indiana does give men the option of registering when obtaining their driver's license or identification card. Well, good on them. The Department of Motor Vehicles of 27 states and two territories automatically register men 18 to 25 with the Selective Service as federally required whenever they apply for driver's license, learner permits, or non-driver identification cards. 27 states out of 50. So basically, if you get a driver's license, you're automatically signed up for it in most states. That This is how serious selective service is. It actually holds men hostage. Men can't not sign up for it. You want a driver's license? Sign up for selective service. You want to go to college and can't pay for it yourself? Sign up for selective service. Oh, you want to be a mailman? Sign up for selective service. Oh, you didn't sign up for selective service when you're supposed to? Sorry, we can't give you this high paying government job. It is coercion to sign up for selective service, whether you want to or not. And this is a responsibility that has been put onto men for 99 years. 99 years. And by the time women are required the same responsibility of it, it's going to be a hundred years. A hundred years that women have escaped this responsibility that men have had to deal with. The fact that they could be drafted and within the last 30 years have been penalized in so many ways for not signing up for it. That is not equality. Feminists are always claiming they want equality while women having to sign up for selective service is equality. But now that we mention women, let's go ahead and talk about the exemption of women for a little bit. 
Now, selective service law, as it is written, refers specifically to male persons in stating who must register and who would be drafted. For women to be required to register with selective service, Congress would have to amend the law to allow women to do it. The constitutionality of excluding women has been was decided in 1981 by the United States Supreme Court and Rosker v. Goldberg, with the court holding that requiring only men to register for the draft did not violate due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. Now, this paragraph basically says that the draft was created for combat troops, but since women could it really be in combat roles that the draft did not apply to them so that's why it's okay to make it male only however on january 23rd 2013 the pentagon decided to end its policy of excluding women from combat positions military and legal analysts speculate that this will open the door for Congress to begin the process to amend the law and remove the exemption from registration requirements. A case that has been brought up in 2015 that a 17-year-old girl is suing the selective service system. I'm not sure why she's doing that specifically, but because she can't sign up for it, she's suing as a form of discrimination. Feminist for probably since the 1980s have been pushing for women to be in combat roles and surprise surprise now that they got it they're selective service but then the feminists are like well no 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 we don't need selective service we shouldn't be sending women off to war that's a bad thing i mean yeah we got them combat positions but no 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 we don't want the draft and you had to know this was coming the only reason why the Supreme Court ruled that women should not be included in the draft was because they were not in combat roles. You pushing them to get into combat roles opened the door. Feminists, if you didn't see this coming, you are much dumber than I gave you credit for. Uh, National Coalition for Men did also try to sue the government as well but the case was eventually thrown out. Now, on June 15th, 2016, which we're talking about today, the United States Senate passed a bill to include women in the Selective Service Registration. Let's go ahead and move on to the specific article in question. Senate votes to require women to register for the draft. In the latest and perhaps decisive battle over the role of women in the military, Congress is embroiled in an increasingly intense debate over whether they should have to register for the draft when they turn 18. On Tuesday, the Senate approved an expansive military policy bill that would have for the first time required young women to register for the draft. The shift, while fiercely opposed by some conservative lawmakers and interest groups, had surprisingly broad support among Republican leaders and women in both parties. Now, we haven't used the draft since 1973. Um, the bill passed on Tuesday, on my birthday, June 14th, uh, requiring that women who turn 18 on or after January 1st, 2018, would be forced to register for selective service, as men must do now. Failure to register could result in the loss of various forms of federal aid, including Pell Grants, a penalty that men already face. Now, John McCain certainly comes up in this as he is the chairman of the Armed Service Committee. I often don't see eye to eye with John McCain, but this might be one time that we do. The fact is, every single leader in this country, both men and women, members of the military leadership, believe that it's fair, since we opened up all aspects to the military to the women, that they would also be registered for selective service. General Robert B. Miller has a good quote as well, who is the Commandant of the Marine Corps. It's my personal view that every American who's physically qualified should register for the draft. I agree with that. Now, Ted Cruz. Oh my fucking God, I hate Ted Cruz. The idea that we should forcibly conscript young girls in combat, to my mind, makes little sense at all. 
says the father of two young daughters. After voting on the pill on Tuesday, uh, Mr. Cruz said in a prepared statement, I could not in good conscience vote to draft our daughters into the military, sending them off to war and forcing them into combat. You stupid fucking prick. Are you fucking kidding me? You can't good good conscience send your daughters off to war? How many parents had to send their children off to war because there was a fucking draft? How dare you, you selfish asshole? To put the lives of your daughters above every other American. Every other parent who had to send their child off to war. I'm glad you're nowhere close to becoming president. You think any parent wanted to do that? You think they were happy and giddy? Maybe some of them were. But no, most of them knew that sending their child to Vietnam was a death sentence. They knew that they were going to die. And many of them didn't make it back home. It sucks that there's a draft. I agree. And maybe there shouldn't be one. But it's perfectly okay for a man to die for his country. But it's wrong for a woman to do it? Are you fucking kidding me? How the fuck did you get elected? As we mentioned before, the House did uh, vote on this bill and passed it. But without this measure for women to sign up for selective service. Now, Republican Representative Duncan Hunter, Republican of California, actually put this into the bill and then actually voted against it, which was interesting. When asked why, the uh, chief of staff for Mr. Hunter said, well, someone had to do it. The House actually liked the bill, but right at the end, they actually took it out. Why? Well, it's because they begin to suggest maybe there shouldn't be a selective service system. Maybe we should just abolish it. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that's a much better thing, and took it out of the bill. Sounds like a delaying tactic to me. Telling people something better so they take it out. Senate actually put it back in. So let's discuss that for a moment, the idea of taking away selective service. It sounds all well and good. And maybe we should do it. However, as much as I would like to see that happen, I actually don't want it to go away. Why? I mean, I know that sounds contradictory to everything else I've said. Why do I not want it to go away? It's simply this. If we take away selective service, there's nothing that stops it from being reinstituted. We could abolish it, but then it gets reinstituted later, say, if there was ever a war so bad that we needed people to be drafted again. In doing so, it would only have the requirement of men doing it. You know as well as I do that if they abolish it and brought it back, it would still only have the requirement of men. And because of that very real possibility, if there's a chance that we can put women on selective service and have to suffer the same responsibility that men are forced to suffer, I'd rather have that than for them to take it away completely and bring it back and only put men on it. Women should have to put as much skin in the game as men do. So if we don't if we get rid of it, we lose the opportunity for women to have to sign up for the draft because it'll be very hard later on when a war does break out to take women out of the draft they might try but it'll be very difficult to do so we have conference committee uh, basically where the house and the senate will meet and we'll talk about that in just a moment a military expert nora benshaw 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 a military policy analyst for the American University School of International Service has stated, I think the change is inevitable. Whether in this debate or through the courts, it just seems that now that you have women allowed to serve in any position in the military, there's no logical basis to say that women should not be drafted. Now, conservative group reacted with anger on Tuesday, allowing our daughters to be forced 
into combat if there is a draft is a clear example of Washington placing more value on liberal social engineering than military objective and preparedness. Liberal social engineering, my God. A lot of conservatives are in favor of this. If anything, the liberal left is against this idea. Feminists have come out of the woodwork saying how they're against this idea of women signing up for the draft. They don't want to send their daughters off to war. So this isn't liberal social engineering. This is evolution. You want women in combat roles. This is what happens when you get that. Deb Fisher, Republican of Nebraska. What people don't seem to understand is just because there's conscription does not mean that all women would serve in the infantry. There are many ways to serve our country in the event of a national emergency. And that's a very true point. If a draft were to happen and men and women were required to sign up, 50, we'll say that it would be an even distribution, 50-50. The 50% of men that would have had to sign up would now go to women. However, of the group of women, I would say that maybe only 1 to 10% of them would actually be an infantry position. The remainder would most likely fulfill uh, jobs in America so their male equivalent could be sent into the war zone. Because while we need combat soldiers in war zones, we still need uh, pencil pushers and cooks. Or many jobs that we need in combat zones. And more than likely, there will still be a pussy pass bias that would say that women should stay home and take care of the country while men should go off to war. And that the total amount of women that actually go into the war zone will be somewhere between 1% to 10%. So this is something that people are not really taking into consideration. So let's talk about how a bill becomes a law. First, to introduce, then there's a committee. Then wrong! That's wrong! Okay, apparently I'm wrong, so... Simpsons Ken, Mr. Smith, can you care to explain to us how a bill becomes a law? Sorry, Krusty, but there's no way I'm letting your airline rerouting bill out of committee. Congressman, I have a tape here of you using your free mail privilege to send a get well card to your aunt. <laughs> If they hear about this in Modesto, I'm ruined. Uh, maybe I wanted to be caught. Now, Homer, that Southern congressman is your biggest obstacle. Your job is to drink him under the table so he misses the vote. You think you can do it? Sir, I studied under Ed McMahon. Now, your job is to attach Krusty's bill to a more popular bill, one that can't fail. The House will now consider the Flags for Orphans bill. Okay, paperclip, do your stuff. Now, we just need a distraction. You call this a bicameral legislature? I say, I say, my groin! We will now vote on the flags for orphans and airline rerouting bill. Oh well, it's paper clipped. Chairman Hayes, any objections? Congressman Beauregard? Mm. I don't want to fight no union. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. The system works. I've become enchanted and illusioned with Washington. I, I'm sure that's how it actually does become a law, but that's not like the official thing. But you'll notice something that Lisa did, where she attached her bill, or rather Krusty's bill, to another bill. And because there was a paper clip, it had to stick. Now, what you saw there is an actual thing. I'm not sure about the paper clip, though, but it's called a rider. And this is something that happens in Senate. And let's go ahead and discuss a little bit of what a writer is. The use of a writer 
is prevalent and customary in the Senate of the Congress of the United States as the Senate rules of germaneness are much more tolerant than those of the House of Representatives. In the House, writers are generally not allowed as any amendment to a bill must deal with the substance of the bill under consideration. Writers are most effective when attached to an important bill, such as an appropriations bill, because to veto or postpone such a bill could delay funding to governmental programs causing serious problems. When the veto is an all or nothing power, as it is in the United States Constitution, the executive must either accept the writers or reject the entire bill. The practical consequence of this custom of using writers is to constrain the veto power of the executive. So what this is basically saying is that they are attaching a lesser bill to a more major bill that should pass such as an appropriations bill. And this bill in question that did get passed is an annual military budget. And this bill gives like $600 billion to the military, which if we owe over $1 trillion in debt to China, maybe we shouldn't have a military for a couple of years. This bill is very, very important. And they attach it to this because if they delay it, then there's going to, the military doesn't get its money. Now, to counteract writers, 43 of the 50 U.S. states have provision in their state's constitution allowing them to use a line item veto so that the executive can veto out single objectionable items from the bill without affecting the main purpose or effectiveness of the bill. Now, at one time... The President of the United States also had this power uh, with the Line Item Veto Act, but the Supreme Court reversed this as being unconstitutional in Clinton versus the city of New York. So now that we understand what a writer is, let's go ahead and look at what is required for a bill to become a law. Okay, so I'm going to ignore some of the introduction and committee discussion, whatever. We're going to go right to the debate portion. So basically we have the House and the Senate and then the voting occurs. Now in the House, debate is limited by the rules formulated in the Rules Committee. The Committee of the Whole debates and amends the bill but cannot technically pass it. Debate is guided by the Sponsoring Committee and time is divided equally between portions and opponents between proponents and opponents. The committee decides how much time to allot to each person. Amendments must be germane to the subject of the bill. No writers are allowed. The bill is reported back to the House to itself and is voted on. A quorum call is a vote to make sure that there are enough members present, 218, to have a final vote. If there is not a quorum, the House will adjourn or will send the sergeant at arms out to round up missing members. Now, technically, this issue of women being required to sign up for the draft is not a rider, as it was originally amendment to the bill by the Congress, the House congressman that we mentioned before. So this was allowed in the House, but they later stripped it out on the promise of getting rid of selective service. The Senate debate is unlimited unless cloister is invoked. I don't know what that is. Members can speak as long as they want and amendments need not to be germane. Writers are often offered. So this, when it was added in, is considered a writer. Even though in the House it would be allowed as an amendment, in the Senate it's considered a writer. Entire bills can therefore be offered as amendments to other bills. Now, unless cloister, cloister is invoked, senators can use filibusters to defeat a measure by talking it to death. And it's interesting that the Simpsons had a Mr. Smith type character kind of explain things because Mr. Smith goes to Washington and had the famous scene where Mr. Smith is filibustering trying to convince people 
that what he was saying was the truth, eventually one person did confirm what he was saying was true. It's a very great scene if you've never seen it. Voting. The bill is voted on. If passed, it is then sent to the other chamber unless that chamber already has a similar measure under consideration. So it was passed in the House and then got sent to the Senate. If either chamber does not pass the bill, then it dies. If the House and the Senate pass the same bill, then it's sent to the President. If the House and Senate pass different bills, they are sent to a conference committee. Most major legislation goes to a conference committee, meaning that the House passes something and then the Senate adds something to the bill, then they go to conference committee. So this is actually something that is a natural occurrence. So there's nothing specific about this issue for why conference committee is happening. It's just a normal function. Now conference committee. Members from each house form a conference committee and meet to work out the differences. The committee is usually made up of senior members who are appointed by the presiding officers of the committee that originally dealt with the bill. The representatives from each house work to maintain their version of the bill. So they meet, they talk about it, both sides want their version of the bill presented to the president. If the conference committee reaches a compromise, it prepares a written conference report which is submitted to each chamber. So they basically have to find a compromise that gives both parties what they want for the final bill. Once they have that compromise, they write it up, send it to each house, and then both have to be approved by the House and Senate, most likely another vote. It is then sent to the President. A bill becomes law if signed by the President or is not signed within 10 days and Congress is in session. So if they're in Congress and they send the bill to the President and the President doesn't sign it within that first 10 days, it's automatically a bill. It's assumed he signed it. If Congress adjourns before for the 10 days and the president has not signed the bill, it then does not become into law. If for any reason there's some emergency shutdown of the government within that 10 days, the bill doesn't get signed into law. If the president vetoes the bill, it is sent back to Congress with a note listing his or her reasons why. Now, it's an all or nothing. He cannot do a line item veto. He has to approve all of it or none of it. There is no middle ground here. The chamber that originated the legislation can attempt to override the veto by a vote of two-thirds of those present. So the chamber that originated this was the House, so this would be sent back to the House. Um, and then they can vote on whether or not to override the veto. If the veto of the bill is overridden, in both chambers then it becomes law so then after the house votes on the veto the senate votes on the veto and if both with a majority of two-thirds say yeah let's override it it can be overwritten and passed as a law negating the need for a president's veto it should be noted here that in both the house and the senate this bill passed with basically like a 90 percent approval and the president has threatened that if a female draft has ever come up, he would veto the bill. However, it's kind of dangerous here for two reasons. One, this is a military bill saying, hey, the military needs $600 billion for, I guess, the next year. If the president delays this, the military is delayed in getting that money for whatever reasons they need the money for. That would be a very bad thing. President Obama already has a pretty low approval rating. The second reason that he needs to consider whether or not to veto this bill is that both the House and the Senate passed it with overwhelming numbers. And even if a few after the fact decide, well, maybe we shouldn't do this, all they need is two-thirds vote. And I believe it was 15 people in the Senate who just to vote nay on this. Meaning, since there's 100 members in the Senate, that's an 85%, and they only need 66%. They need 66 people 
to say yes and 85 have already done it. So the president being aware of this, he has to decide if he's going to veto it or not. So let's go ahead and jump to the conference committee. Now this met last Thursday. As far as I know, there is no word yet on what the committee has decided, but it is being discussed right now as we speak. As it mentions, the House did at one point have similar language in their authorization bill draft, but stripped it during the last month that was in debate, favoring for the elimination of the Selective Service Agency, which has an annual cost of $23 million a year to maintain even though it's basically doing nothing. $23 million for the selective service system that basically says, if there's ever a draft, these are the people that have to be signed up for it. So they met Thursday to discuss it. Uh, Senator John McCain is one of those. Democrat from Rhode Island, Jack Reed State, I think it's important to include that Women have demonstrated superb skill in every aspect of military operation, and I think it's just a recognition of their contributions to the military. So I hope it's not a major fight. And certainly we need women in the military just like we need men in the military. Maybe we don't need women in combat roles in the military, but you know I'm not against opening up combat roles for women so long as they pass the same standard. I mean, there's not going to be a combat zone specific for women saying, oh, the enemy is only shooting you with rubber bullets. You go over there and the men will stay here and deal with the live fire. The House Armed Service Committee Chairman Mac Thornberry has stated that he thinks that we ought to study whether we need it or not before we get to the question of who should be registered. You know when it was a great time to bring that up? 1973, when we stopped using the draft. 1973, 42 years later, we're like, do we even need it? Why should we put women in this when we're not even really using it anymore? It's been like four or five decades. Are you fucking kidding me? The moment we threatened to put women in to sign up for the draft, now we're kind of coming. Do we really even need it? Are you? Oh my Fucking God. I mean, this is misandry written all over it. It's perfectly okay for men to sign up for something. It's perfectly okay to coerce men into signing up for something. But the moment that we have to face the possibility of women having to sign up for it, it's like, well, maybe we can get rid of it. Do we? Nah, I mean, come on, guys. Do, do Are we ever going to really have a draft again? Because you know what, if they got rid of the draft, I think what men should do is sue the United States federal government for forcing men to sign up for selective service after so many decades of there not being a draft. After being coerced into signing up for them to simply take it away the moment a woman might have had to sign up for it. If that happens, I hope there is a lot of men out there who sue the federal government for that. Because that is ridiculous. A moment a woman has to enter in, now we're considering whether or not we really need it. We needed that 40 fucking years ago. Where were you then? Where was our government saying that we no longer needed selective service? Oh, I know they were saying we needed it and changed the rules to make it possible to force men into it whether they wanted to or not. Oh, you want a driver's license? Here, here's your driver's license. Oh, and here's also this card that says you've now signed up for selective service. Oh, you didn't want to sign up for selective service? Too bad we signed you up anyways. That's basically the video for today. This is exciting times. You know, it's great that women are now having to face the same responsibility that men have to face. Now, here's the other thing is, is what's the likelihood of there being another draft? Actually, there's a very poor chance that there would ever be another draft. And the reason why is that our military is more technology than it is people. In fact, people are being dismissed from the military. I think they're saying that one in six people are being approved to go into the military. 
The military really doesn't need numbers anymore. If we fight in another war, it's going to be primarily technological. Now, yes, that we did have Afghanistan and Iraq. These wars were still primarily a technological war. We did have boots on the ground, but that was people we already had in there. That's why there was no draft. We didn't need it. And any future wars most likely not going to require that unless for some reason the technology we have is an inadequate against our enemy. And that would be the only way a draft would occur. But this, this is a very important issue. Because if men are going to be coerced into signing up for it, then women should be coerced into signing up for it. And I don't want it abolished because if it's abolished, it can be reinstituted and it still requires that only men sign up for it. I want women to be forced to sign up for it the way men have. The way men have been forced to sign up for it for the last hundred years. Hundred years, men have had to face this responsibility. And any time we have brought up this conversation to feminists, the usual response is, well, there hasn't been a draft since the 70s. It's been abolished. No, it hasn't been abolished. We just haven't reactivated it yet. Well, guess what, feminists? You kept pushing and pushing and pushing for women to be in combat roles. Now they are. Now there's going to be... Women signing up for selective service. But don't worry. The draft was abolished. Ooh, does that sting for feminism. We're now going to use the same argument against you. Oh, so wonderful. You brought this on yourself, feminists. You wanted equality. You're now getting equality. And men everywhere are celebrating, saying, We had to do it, now it's your turn to do it. Would be even greater if for the next hundred years, women were required to sign up for the draft and men didn't. That's not going to happen, but that would be nice. And then after the hundred years that women were required to do it, then it's abolished. A hundred years for men, hundred years for women, and then no more. Because I would love for the selective service system just to be abolished for good. I mean, if there was a guarantee that the United States could never, ever again enact a draft. That they could never bring back the selective service system. I would be in favor of that. But I know full damn well they would bring it back if absolutely necessary. And if they do, if any time there's a draft again, I want women to also sign up for that draft. To be forced to go into the military, just like men were. Anyways, that's going to do it for me today. Check the description down below for reference to the articles we mentioned today. Um, also check out my Patreon just trying to save up money for a computer right now that's like the first thing on my list um, well insurance computer what have you but I do need a computer because the last uh, major video I uploaded which was the Star Trek video my computer barely could handle that it kept crashing as I edited it it kept crashing as I kept rendering it and I had to like you know, do a rain dance just to get the thing to work. Is that cultural appropriation? I hope not. But, I mean, I finally, finally got it to get together because I really wanted to upload that video. But, I, in order to do a higher quality video for all of you, which I really, really want to do, I need a new computer. However, my ultimate goal with Patreon is to get money to get myself a procedure that could help me with my disability, make me a more productive member of society, but it's very expensive. While a computer would cost anywhere from one to three thousand dollars, this procedure could cost anywhere from six to twenty thousand. Got a little extra money? Consider giving me a dollar. You like what I do? Consider giving me a dollar. One dollar helps me out a lot right now. So, 
If you like the work I do and you want to help me out, please consider donating to my Patreon. However, if you're not comfortable with doing Patreon, and I guess I can't blame you there because everyone and their mother has a Patreon account, consider buying my book. Now, this book, these two books, were actually one long story that I divided up into two. And the first book I wanted to release for free. So go ahead and download it because that helps me out. Read it. If you like it, leave a comment, honest review. And if you really, really like it, consider buying the next book that comes directly after that, $2.99. It's about vampires, medieval France, bubonic plague, Templar knights, Pope. I mean, there's just a lot of adventure in this story. And I plan to write more as I build up the revenue so I can give you high quality work. However, you're welcome to just go ahead and buy it and never read it. I, I'm perfectly okay with that. I mean, I'd prefer if you did read it, but if you just buy it to help me out and then never read it, because the more people buy it, the more they rate it, the higher my book comes up in search results so people can accidentally find it and download it and read it and rate it and then buy the next book. So every little bit helps. Even if it doesn't feel like you're doing that much, believe me, it helps me out a lot. So thank you for watching my video today. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Thumbs up. Share it on social media. Tell everyone you really, really like this video. Anyways, I'll check you all later. This is Mad Cat signing off.